Good morning, church. It's my pleasure to bring you the Bible reading this morning from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voices go out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, the honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I'll be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Beautiful words. Now, before we uh, dive in and have a look at uh, Psalm 19, I just wanted to make mention of something that I've uh, alluded to. If you've been coming along uh, to church the last few weeks, you've probably noticed that our 9 a.m. service is pretty full. Uh, we've reached capacity in the auditorium. Obviously, we're, we're a bit limited with our restrictions at the moment, but we've reached capacity really for the last month or so. Um, and we've had to move kids' church as well out of the shed over into the performance theater at Genesis to be able to fit uh, more kids in and to create more space. Now, this is obviously a wonderful um, problem or, or issue to have. I mean, we're so grateful to God for the, the growth that we're seeing and, and the, the people that are coming along, um, even in the face of the restrictions. But obviously, we also want everyone to be able to come along. We want you to be able to invite people and, and for there to be space for people uh, to come along, for more people to join us as we follow Jesus together. I mean, after all, that's why we exist, to help more people find the, the true and lasting and real life that is found only in Jesus. And so we're beginning to think through some ways that we might be able to create more space uh, on a Sunday morning for more people uh, to come along. I just wanted to, to let you know that that uh, process is, is happening. I wanted to invite you to pray for us, that we might not just do what is easy or simple, but we might pray big prayers and take big steps for, for the good of our, other people and for the glory of God. So really exciting. Love for you to pray for us. And uh, that's what I'm going to do right now as we uh, open up God's word together. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you've done for us in Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, that you promised that you would build your church and nothing will stand against it. And Lord, we know, we have seen this promise. It's proven to be true, Lord, through the centuries. And we pray, Lord, that you might use us in some small way for the advance of your kingdom in our time for your glory. And so, Lord, please equip us, please fill us, please uh, give us wisdom as we think about the way forward to help more people find real life in Jesus, Lord. We love you, and as we now come to your word, Lord, we ask that our words would be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For the last few weeks, we have been in a sermon series called Untangled, Making Sense of Our Emotions. Now, we're actually coming to the end of the series. Next week will be our, our final week. 
But we've really covered some good ground so far. If you can remember back to week one, we talked about the role that emotions play in our lives. Last week, oh sorry, two weeks ago, we talked about how we navigate our emotions before God. And then last week, we talked about how we navigate emotions together in our relationships. And I hope by now you've realized that cultivating a godly, healthy, emotional life, it's not just going to happen. It's going to take work and time and effort and grace. Now, I think about it a little bit like cultivating a garden. You know, like lots of people, when we went down into lockdown last year, I decided to do a bit of gardening. I put in a garden bed around our, our garage, which I'd been wanting to do for a long time. I did what I think you had to do. I prepared the soil, laid some newspaper for the weeds, put the mulch on, planted the plants, and then watered them and fertilized them and so on. And, and amazingly, it worked. I was expecting, I'm not much of a green thumb, so I was expecting just a dead plants to be all around my garage, but I've got to admit, I'm pretty happy with how the garden has worked out. But here's the thing that I learned in doing that. It didn't just happen. It took time and effort and work and water and fertilizer and so on. It doesn't just happen. And it's the same in our emotional lives. To grow in emotional health is not just going to happen automatically. It's going to take attention and time and effort and grace. And this is really what we're talking about this week and next week. How we can cultivate our emotional lives. The title for today's sermon is Nourishing Healthy Emotions. And the title for next week is Starving Unhealthy Emotions. For the next few weeks, we are paying attention to the garden bed of our hearts. And you know, the Bible has a lot to say about this. The Bible regularly and often commands or gives us commands about what we ought to feel or not to feel. For example, the Bible says to us or commands us to rejoice, to forgive from the heart, to love with brotherly affection, to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, to give cheerfully to be fervent in spirit, to desire the word, to be tender-hearted, to weep, to give thanks. I mean, the Bible often commands us and gives us instructions to experience and to express certain emotions. As John Piper says, a, a preacher and an author from the United States, he says, we are commanded to feel, not just to think or decide, we are commanded to experience dozens of emotions not just to perform acts of willpower. In other words, God is not just interested in what we believe, what we think, what we do, though obviously he's interested in that, but God is also interested in how we feel. And this is why it's important for us to know how we can nourish healthy emotions, how we can starve unhealthy emotions. That's what we're talking about this week and next week. Now, I would really encourage you, if you're kind of parachuting in on this week, I'd really encourage you to go back and listen to the first three weeks because we laid a lot of important groundwork um, in those weeks to to build upon what we're talking about the next couple of weeks. But what I'd like to do today is just give us three simple practices that will help us to nourish healthy emotions. Now, when I sat down at the start of the week, I had six. Now I'm giving you three, so you're welcome. (laughs) Now, I want to be clear right from the start that these are not sophisticated techniques for us to master. They're actually really simple spiritual habits for us to practice. Simple spiritual habits that will nourish our relationship with God because it's from our relationship with God that that healthy emotions can begin to flow. And, And so today, I don't think I'm sharing, or I know I'm not sharing anything revolutionary. But I don't think we need revolutionary. I think we need the ordinary means of grace that God has given to us that will help to nourish our faith and our emotional lives. I would also add that this list of steps that I'm giving us today is not exhaustive. I mean, there are more than three ways to nourish healthy emotions. Like I said, at the start of the week, I had six. I mean, emotions are complex. They factor in emotional uh, 
uh, sorry, uh, spiritual factors, physical factors, psychological factors, social factors. And so the steps I'm giving us today, they're not exhaustive. But hopefully they'll just serve as a gentle nudge to get us moving in the right direction. So with that being said, let's look at three practices that will nourish our emotional health. And the first is this. Read your Bible. <laughs> now I know what some of you are thinking, really. Read, read the Bible. That's the best you've got. I mean, it doesn't sound like a very imaginative suggestion. It actually might even sound like a, a trite answer to a complex topic. It might actually even make you feel guilty and ashamed because in the past you've turned to the Bible and it hasn't actually helped you with what you're feeling. I get that. Whatever the case may be, I'm not suggesting that the simple act of reading the Bible is the final and only solution to our emotional lives. I'm not suggesting a verse a day keeps depression away or anxiety away or anything like that. I'm not saying we shouldn't see a doctor or take medication. Please let me be very, very clear on that. But I am simply suggesting that the Bible can and should play a central role in cultivating healthy emotions in our lives. And I think we see this in Psalm 19, this psalm that we had read for us just a moment ago, which was written by King David. Now, this psalm essentially tells us how God has revealed himself to us. How God has made himself known to us. And the second half of Psalm 19 tells us that God has revealed himself to us through his word. Or as the psalmist puts it, his law, his statutes, his precepts, his commands, his decrees. Which as uh, David says, is perfect, trustworthy, right, radiant, pure, firm, righteous. David is saying God's word is really, really valuable. It's really, really important. But David also tells us in this psalm that God's word is really powerful. It does something for us. For instance, he says in verse 7, it refreshes our soul. It, it makes us wise. Verse 8, it gives joy to our hearts and light to our eyes. In other words, the Bible not only changes the way we think, the Bible can also change the way we feel. It can give us refreshment, wisdom, joy, and insight. This is why David goes on to say it's more precious than gold and it's sweeter than honey. Now again, let me be clear. I'm not saying if you're having a panic attack, if you open up the Bible to Jesus' genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, it's suddenly going to make that panic attack disappear. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is if you read the Bible regularly over the years, if you allow its songs and its stories and its sermons and its promises and its prophecies and its people to wash over you, to sink into you, it will change you. Even if you don't recognize it in that moment. I think about it a little bit like eating a healthy, balanced diet. You know, if you eat... Brussels sprouts and salmon and spinach and broccoli. It, it, it might not make you feel very happy in the moment. If you eat Brussels sprouts, it's definitely not going to make you feel happy in the moment. Ugh. But over time, you will notice a difference. You'll have more energy. You'll sleep better. Your old pants will fit. I mean, it will change you. It's the same with reading the Bible. The simple act of reading the Bible is not going to change us in instantaneously. But slowly, gradually, over time, as we allow it to wash over us and to sink into us, our minds are being renewed. Our souls are being refreshed. Our hearts are being encouraged. Our eyes are being opened to God and to his truth. Here's the way Alistair Groves puts it in the book that I've mentioned to you a number of times. He says, in our Bibles... We find God reaching across eons, oceans, languages, and foreign cultures to catch our attention and have a talk. Will you listen? Will you reply? Your emotions will be nourished as you do. The Word of God refreshes our soul. And so the first step towards nourishing healthy emotions is to read your Bible. The second step is this. Go outside. 
Now again, I thank you so much, Captain Obvious. I get it. This is not revolutionary. Most of us know that to go outside is good for us. But here's the thing. In our day, in our digital age, I think this bears repeating. According to some studies, we spend on average more than six hours a day online. The average Aussie household has almost seven screens, which is, I think, more than the average number of people in an average Aussie household. We interact with phones, according to one study, swipe, click, tap, touch, pick up, 2,617 times a day, on average. I think it's safe to say that most of us, including me, we could do with stepping away from our screens and spending some time outside. Now again, let me be clear, going outside is not a magical solution. If you stand for a few minutes in the sun, it does not guarantee automatically that, that you're going to feel better. But generally speaking, there is great value in going outside to feel the breeze, to breathe fresh air, to watch the birds, to gaze at the stars, to remind yourself that you live on a larger stage and you are part of a larger story than just the four walls of your home or, or the four walls of your office. You are one of God's creatures you're part of God's story, and you live in God's world. And this is actually what Psalm 19 also tells us. Remember, it, it tells us how God reveals himself to us. The second half tells us through his word. Well, the first half tells us that God reveals himself through his world. Psalm 19 verse 1 said, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. In other words, from the moment you've been born... You have been listening to a sermon. The heavens have been preaching at you. The sky has been proclaiming something to you. It's been telling you something. That there is a God who made you. That this universe is not a random collection of molecules. It is the meaningful work of a good and glorious God. And when you go outside and you look up, you look around, you look down... This world is telling you that God made all things, including you, and that God has a plan to redeem and to restore this world. And so when it comes to nourishing healthy emotions, maybe one of the easiest and, and simplest things we can do is go for a walk. But not just go for any walk, go for a walk with our eyes open, to look up at the skies, to look at the trees, to look at the grass, to stop, to be still, and to say, Thank you. To appreciate what God has given to us. Probably won't solve your emotional turmoil in that instant, but it might start moving you in the right direction. So to help nourish healthy emotions, number one, we have the Word of God. Number two, we have God's world that He's given to us. And thirdly and finally, that the third thing we can do is cling to corporate worship. Again, I know what you're thinking. Another simplistic answer to a complex topic. And of course a pastor's going to say this. Go to church. <laughs> but again, I would simply say what I said at the start, that God has ordained simple, ordinary means to produce wonderful, extraordinary fruit in our lives. And this includes the gathering together with God's people. Hebrews 10, in a, in a well-known passage, it says to us, And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works. In other words, we need to think about one another so we can encourage one another towards love for God and towards good works in His kingdom. How do we do that? Not neglecting to gather together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching, the day of Jesus' return. You know, I think of Sunday worship like this a, a little bit like an oasis, you know, an oasis is a fertile spot in the desert. It's a place where you find water and shade and, and rest. It's a place of refuge. And in a similar way, when we walk through life, it can sometimes feel like we're walking through the desert. The sun is beating down on us. We're thirsty, we're weary, we're worn out. But then on Sundays, as we come to the gathering of God's people, we hear the life-giving 
news of the gospel proclaimed to us. The living water that is found in Jesus. The encouragement we receive from one another. We find an oasis in the desert. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is always the case. I know churches can and have been places of pain for some of us. They've sometimes felt more like a wasteland than an oasis. Nor am I suggesting that every time you come to church, you're going to have a rich spiritual and emotional experience. I just don't think that that's true or we should expect that. But what I am suggesting is that the regular rhythm of gathering with God's people to hear his word, to sing his praise, to be with his people, it will over time produce fruit in our lives. Because generally speaking, God has designed the church to be a safe harbour for sinners and sufferers like us. Now what is it specifically about corporate worship that can nourish our faith and nourish our emotions? I think firstly it's being with like-minded believers. It's being with other people who have placed their faith and their trust and their lives in, in Jesus' hands. It reminds you that you're not alone and you're not insane. I mean, it, it, when you come to church, you see people from all different ages and stages of life, from all different backgrounds and cultures and conditions, and, and yet we are all bound together in Jesus. We're all part of something larger than ourselves. Now, let me just say, this is actually one of the drawbacks of church online now we love church online we're, we're, we're thankful for it we're going to continue to stream church online into the future but when you're streaming church online in your living room you're not surrounded by the people of God you don't get to see all of the different people whom Jesus has drawn to himself now wherever possible God has designed church to be an embodied experience where the body gathers together. Now I know there's lots of different reasons why we might engage in church online, but as we continue to move forward in this unique season, let's not neglect, as Hebrews says, to gather together. This is also one of the reasons why we're, we're wanting to create more space for more people to come. We want more people to hear and experience the goodness of God through the word of his gospel and through the gathering of his people. We want more people to find the life that is found in Jesus. And so this is one of the ways that our emotions are encouraged and stirred through cor corporate worship. It's gathering together with like-minded believers. I think another reason is also singing together with other believers. Have you ever wondered why we devote at least a third of our corporate gathering to singing? I mean, there's not many other places in our culture and in our day where we sing together. Maybe at concerts or, or in the car if we're in the car with a few other people and we're on a road trip or, or occasionally at the footy. But generally speaking, we don't sing together. So why at church do we devote a third of our gathering time to singing? Well, of course, one reason is to praise God. Psalm 96 says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise His name. We praise God because God is worthy of our praise. We also sing to proclaim what God has done for us. Psalm 96 goes on to say in verse 2, Sing to the Lord, praise His name, proclaim His salvation day after day. When we sing, we are literally proclaiming and declaring to one another what God has done for us in Christ. We sing to praise, we sing to proclaim, but we also sing to stir our affections. I mean, singing moves us in a way that almost nothing else does. It helps to bridge the gap between our head and our hearts. It, it brings us alive to the truths that we're singing about. So Psalm 147 verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. In other words, it's good, it's pleasant, it's fitting for us to sing together. You know, when we sing, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. I cannot help but be moved. Singing stirs our affections. 
And, you know, we really can say this about every aspect of our service together. You know, when we hear a sermon, we hopefully not only have our minds filled with God's truth, but also hopefully we have our hearts moved. We're encouraged, we're convicted, we're comforted. I mean, whatever it is. When we partake in Lord's Supper, we literally taste the goodness of God in Christ. When we witness a baptism, as we did this morning, we see the promises of God symbolized. And it stirs us, it moves us, it helps us to keep walking the journey forward together. And so as I close, I want to share with us a story from one of our own members. And I've shared it with you before, but I think it's so fitting for what we've been talking about today. You know, this person a few years ago went through, they said, one of the most difficult times of their life. They were under significant stress and anxiety. There were sleepless nights. There were times of crying out to God in confusion and anger. They were at an incredibly low place. But they said there were a few things that enabled them to take some steps to move forward on the journey. The first step, they said, was that they began to talk to someone about how they were feeling. They write and they say, my encouragement for anyone wrestling with stress and anxiety would be to talk to someone who can remind you of the fact that God is still in control and to remind you of God's promises. Even as a long-term Christian, when you have tunnel vision only on your problems, you easily forget about the promises God has made to us. They also found comfort in God's word. One day at home, they came across a devotional book uh, on the shelf, that it went through the entire book of Psalms in a year. And they picked it up and they began to read it. And this is what they say. They say, it's amazing the way that the psalmist felt in so many of the psalms resonated exactly with my feelings at the time. And then they also highlighted the importance of gathering with God's people, of going to church. This person describes the temptation that when life is hard, when life is difficult, the temptation is to pull back, to withdraw because you don't feel like going to church. But he testifies to the power of being with others. He says there was one Sunday evening in particular where we played one of our stories of grace, you know, the the testimony of someone in our church family. And this person had a lifelong and significant health issue. And he says he looked around and there was also someone else there that night who he knew were undergoing treatment for cancer. And, And yet there they were in church singing praises to God. He said, in that moment, it gave me perspective and it encouraged me to keep going. Now, they sound like very ordinary things, don't they? Talking to someone, reading the Bible, going to church. And yet, it's exactly in the ordinary things where God meets us powerfully. Where God encourages us through these ordinary means to keep going and to not give up. And so I think the call from God to us today is to do that, to press into these ordinary means of grace that he has given us, the promises of his word, the beauty of his world, and the presence and love and support and encouragement of his people. See, it's like last week, we're all part of the body and we all have a role to play. So let's do it together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us in so many ways. We thank you, Lord, that even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even when we walk through incredible darkness and incredible difficulty in this life and in this world, You have given us the sure and the certain hope in Jesus. You have given us the firm foundation of your word. You have given us the comforting presence of your spirit and of your people. So Lord, help us to lean on these things. Help us to throw all our weight onto these things so that we might not grow weary in doing good so that we might not give up and turn away, so that we might continue to be nourished and encouraged to keep moving forward for the good of others and for the glory of your name. And we 
pray this through the name of your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Would you stand for this closing blessing from God's Word before we sing together? May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus' name.